Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Devo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays at 9 a.m. If you're in the neighborhood, I'd love to have you come by at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley. Just a quick little announcement in our community. I know this will not uh, have any, any um, weight later on down the road after this coming Saturday, if you're watching this a year from now. But we're having a yard sale, and we're really busy over here uh, in Sky Country area, so you're welcome to join us tomorrow all day long from 5 o'clock in the morning till evening. Over hundreds and hundreds of homes will be uh, selling their junk, which will be another man's treasure, huh? Treasures. Treasure, junk, whatever. <laughs> it's all junk to me. <laughs> so... Anyway, that's what's going on. Let's open up our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's pray. Uh, gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for your precious word, Lord. Where would we be without the word of God? Now, that is something that we should think about. What this world would be like without having God's word. When we see all the different religions that are out there, all the different cults and occults, Lord. Uh, it is amazing the possibility of evil prevailing without the word of God. I thank you that we have the truth absolute, unequivocally, with empirical evidence, the truth of God through the Holy Bible. And Lord, for those of us that believe that, may you continue to strengthen us and give us wisdom, Lord. And for those that question that thought, I pray, Lord, you open up their eyes to finally come to a point where they surrender their lives to the Word of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And let me ask you a quick question. Is there a heaven? Yes. Yes. Well, we all say that. I mean, that's our hope, right? That there is a heaven. But how do we really know if there's a heaven? Because the Bible says so, okay? And that's a great answer. Is there any other way that we really know that there's a heaven? Is there some sort of experience that somebody had? I mean, we see the Bible says that God himself says it, that he sits in the heavenlies. Paul said there's three types of heavens very clearly. So we know in the Bible it says it. We also have a story of Paul himself visiting that heaven. We do have stories that are similar to Paul's experience um, in our modern day, where people say that they have literally died and gone to heaven, seen some light, seen someone pulling them towards heaven, and others who say they've seen hell itself. So is that enough evidence? I think it is. I, I think it's beyond that. But there is a sense where, where when you see that there's a possibility of better, like that logic of something being better than what it is now, then there's that possibility of something being better than this world outside of it. You see what I'm saying? So there's a logic there. So if you're in, if you're in a situation where you're, you're at the bottom of the barrel, and guess what? Everything looks, is looking up for you, right? A little bit is, is you're grateful for. So there's always a hope of something better. Now, that's not necessarily enough evidence, but I think it's enough evidence that it would give you the, um, the intent of heaven itself, you know, the preponderance of the evidence, and you go to court, how do you prove that there's a heaven? You might not have the actual fact and scene, but there's enough evidence of it that there's a preponderance of the evidence that you would have to come to the conclusion that there's a heaven, right? Preponderance, you know what that means, right? Uh, there's all kinds of various evidences in different forms and ways, like looking at, he at the beauty of God's creation itself speaks of a creator. So if there's a creator, where does this creator dwell? must be heaven, up beyond our sphere, outside of our, our sphere, actually. So the preponderance of evidence uh, shows that there's a heaven. Uh, the same is, is true in the court of law when someone commits a crime, and let's say nobody's, you know, let's just say a, a crime of passion, where a husband, oh boy, where a husband, I like that sound, where a husband is accused of killing his wife, right? But no one's seen the crime. So how do you prove that? You know, you need a preponderance of evidence. You've got phone calls, you've got people he's talked to, you have evidence, you have weapons, you have fingerprints, you know, you have uh, um, eyewitness accounts where they were arguing and people saw, you say all this stuff and say, well, there's a motive here. 
So the chances are he probably did it, you know, with the preponderance of evidence. Now, could he have not done it? Of course. He could be lying through his teeth that he didn't do it, that he was at this place and having an alibi, and that would be evidence enough to say that he didn't. So I think we have enough evidence. So let's look at Paul's experience with heaven. It is uh, doubtless... Or necessary would be a better word in, in the Greek there. It is necessary, not profitable for me to boast. So he, he's just saying here, is that it's really not a boast, but I need to share this with you because it's the truth. This is so grand that it would be wrong for me not to share with you, to bring encouragement to you. I will come, I will come to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ, who 14 years ago, whether in the body, I do not know, or whether out of the body, I do not know. God knows. So there's, there's a sense of, uh, a, a, or a sense of lack of understanding, right? He doesn't fully understand what was taking place uh, in this man's life 14 years ago. Uh, he truly doesn't understand if he was still in the body and in this revelation, or if he was out of the body in this revelation, uh, or what? He just is going to share what he experienced and leave it at that and let God determine the rest. And by the way, this is not a passage you use for astral projection, you know, because some will go, oh, look at Paul. He was outside of his body. So what's wrong with being outside of your body? Because these New Ager spiritualists will say you need to meditate and pull yourself out of your body. And then you can bring healing to your body. You can experience life. You can travel the world. Some suggest that they've traveled to Spain, to Rome, to other places and galaxies because they're out of their body. The question is this, who's in their body while they're gone? You're opening yourself up to something demonic if you're not in your body. And that has happened. And then they have demonic possessions there that give them other kinds of experiences. So this is not a, a, a um, passage to prove astral projection at all. He is just saying, I don't understand how this happened. But he goes on and he says, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. So the third heaven is outside of the sphere of this universe. This is the sphere of God himself where heaven dwells. So let's look at it this way. If you had a TV the TV would represent the earth and the universe, everything in it. We are outside of that TV and we see the TV. So that's the sphere that God is in. He's outside of the universe because he's the creator. So he's outside of it looking at everything. How that looks, I have no idea. He's just outside of it. And he's not a part of his creation, though he can enter into that, and he did through his son Jesus Christ. So he says, I don't know, but he went to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows again. He repeats himself. How he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. And that's an interesting statement there. First, he was caught up to paradise. Who else was caught up to paradise? You remember? The thief on the cross, right? Jesus said, to, I'll remember you today in paradise. So that thief went to heaven. Galatians, or, or uh, here too, but Galatians says, absent from the body is what? Present, present with the Lord. So there's a heaven that we go to when we're absent from this body, when we die, and this body goes back to the dust of the earth. Our spirit goes to heaven, to paradise. Paradise is not on earth. It is speaking of heaven itself. And Paul is saying here that this man was caught up into heaven, paradise. And they, he heard inexpressible words. So inexpressible means hard to understand, to comprehend. Um, he could not even explain the words that he heard, and that's why he uses the word inexpressible words. Uh, I can't explain it to you, but it, it was amazing what happened. And, and that's your way of saying is I can't explain it, but it was so beyond me that I cannot explain it to you. So that's what Paul is saying here, uh, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Then he says it's not lawful for a man to utter. It would be wrong. It would be against the law. If there was a law that said, uh, utter it, then you wouldn't do it because it's, you can't. You can't. So you know what this tells me? That these people who say they died and went to heaven and they write books and they tell you everything that went into heaven, everything that was said into heaven, they're lying. 
They are lying and all they're doing is selling books. The sad part is that people believe them and they buy their books and then they take it as gospel truth. And it's contrary, when you read their books, it's contrary to what the scriptures say. You know, oftentimes you'll hear me say, there's no biblical evidence for that. You know, we don't see anything like that happening in scripture, so the chances are it's unbiblical, you know? It's silent in that area. Not necessarily saying it's sinful, it's just it's not something that is biblical, that God is, is implementing as something to do in the kingdom of God. And I mentioned that on Wednesday, you remember that, there's certain things, um, like chaplains. There's nowhere in the Bible that it talks about chaplains. So God's silent on that. He talks about pastors and bishops and so forth. And I'm not, and please don't misunderstand me. I'm not coming down on chaplains. They're, they're doing a great work, and especially if they're being very biblical, and they are in some many cases. I have good friends that are chaplains and doing a great job. But it's not a biblical position or place. It's something that has been made, and it's outside of that. So you can't really say that God has made chaplains, but he's allowed them. And you can't say that God has criteria for chaplains because there are none in the Bibles. He has criteria for a bishop and a pastor, and those criteria are good for good men too. If you're just a man and want to be more godly, read Timothy, read Titus. You know, read those pastoral epistles and apply those things to your life and you'll become a very godly man. So here he's saying it's unlawful for to, to even say such a thing. Of such a one I will boast, yet of myself, I will not boast except in my infirmities. So most will think because of this verse that he's speaking about himself here. Though he says, I knew a man. John does the same thing, right, about himself. When you read the gospel, he never mentions his name. And the disciple laid his head on his, he's speaking about his, his beloved disciple laid his head on the, the breast of Jesus. You know, he's speaking of himself, but he dare not say his name there. You know, but you know he's speaking of himself. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will speak the truth. But I forbear, lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. And least I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations and thorns in the flesh given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet at me. So apparently Paul has a thorn in his flesh, whatever it is we don't know. There's a lot of supposition some say that he has eye problems and there are passages where he has people writing for him because uh, of his eye problems. And there's some areas where he says, I have literally written this part myself. Uh, others suggest, and I don't know where they get this, but that Paul had some sort of sin that was uh, a thorn in his side and it was constantly there, like fornication or some sort of sexual sin in his life. And that was always buffeted from uh, buffeting him. But he goes on and says, least I be exalted above measure concerning these things. I plead with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. So he struggled with this and he prayed three times. Lord, please take it away. And the Lord wouldn't take it away. And I don't believe this is a text to say that you can only ask the Lord three times, right? Because sometimes you say, well, Paul only asked three and that was it. He stopped asking. Well, that's Paul in this situation. He finally realized that, hey, this is something that's going to be with me for the rest of my life. And so I have to hang on to God's grace above anything else. Uh, Jesus said, ask, seek, and knock, and those are in the tenses of a continual action. They're not uh, punctilar at all, they are continuous. So you keep asking, you keep seeking, you keep knocking until God gives you the answer. And if God says no, then it's no. You have to deal with it. I'm at a point with my own injury where I'm thinking it's never gonna get better. I may have to live with it for the rest of my life. And it's a struggle at times because I want it to go and I see glimpses of hope that I'm getting better. Some, and sometimes I'll come here in the morning, I'll actually try to run around these chairs. Not like in a holy Pentecostal, filled with the spirit way. <laughs> but literally try to run, so I'll just kind of jog one time, then I'll stop and see how I feel by the end of the day. Um, and being able to do that is pretty amazing for me. It's like a big big uh, advancement in my healing. I remember uh, years ago, a doctor said, I want you to try to jump. And so I stood in place and I raised my arm as I went and I, and I didn't, couldn't jump. I just couldn't. And I go, I can't. She goes, why can't you jump? I go, I don't know. And it was a psychological thing because I had not jumped in seven, eight years. She goes, you need to jump. And I just couldn't. It took me about a good five minutes to finally 
figure out jump. And when I jumped and landed, I go, ow. She goes, okay, don't do that. <laughs> Why did you ask me to jump in the first place, you know? Well, we have to measure where you're at, you know? And I couldn't jump. And now I'm able to jump without any... Now, don't ask me to jump continually because I probably can't do that. But at least I can jump once. And yes, Mexicans can jump. <laughs> I was a basketball player, so I know. All right, let's look at verse 8. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So strength is made perfect in weakness. Wow. So in our weaknesses, God can strengthen us. I shared with you guys before uh, how God can take our weaknesses and do something spectacular, miraculous. I went to Oklahoma for a, for a funeral, and I tell you, I was hurting from my injury. I literally could not do it, and when I was in my room uh, the night before the funeral, I just cried out to God that you're going to have to do something miraculous here, Lord, because I can't do this. And I was weeping and crying. I took all my medication, my muscle relaxers, my painkillers, my anti-inflammatories. I mean, I, I was gone. Uh, with all of this stuff in me, because they all cause you to be drowsy. And I just said, Lord, you're going to have to take care of this. And when I woke up in the morning, I had no pain. It was completely gone. I was able to go through the whole funeral, through the whole wake. We even uh, were able to fellowship with the friends that I was visiting. We went out and shot guns together and rifles and sniper weapons and you know all kinds of neat stuff and uh, had a great time. They took me to the airport, got to the airport fine with no problem. Uh, it was like a two-hour drive to get to the airport because we were in, out in Oklahoma somewhere. And uh, got on the plane, and I sat down, and pain came right back. <laughs> so, you know, God can give you strength in your weaknesses when it really matters, and he has a purpose. Because God used uh, that situation to save people and to minister to people at that time, so... And Paul, so Paul says here, in my weakness, God will be strong. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You know, I told somebody the other day because they corrected me on my grammar in the bulletin. And I said, God uses the foolish things, you know. And the, uh, the gentleman says, we use that excuse a lot, don't we? <laughs> you know, and I, I laughed with him. I got what he was saying that, you know, it's just an excuse, but it's not an excuse, guys. God does use the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. He takes those that can't, and he will do something with them, even though they can't spell correctly, even though they can't parenthesize things because I was being corrected on that. And I, well, I received it well, and even received that, that thing because we're willing to just let God work through us as we surrender our lives to him. So he says, therefore, I take pleasure in my my infirmities, my reproach and needs and persecution and distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I have become a fool in boasting. You have compelled me for I ought to have been commanded by you. For in nothing was I behind the most eminent apostles, though I am nothing. Truly the signs of an apostle were accomplished among you with all perseverance and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. For what is is what is it in which you were in fear to other churches except that I myself was not burdensome to you? Forgive me this wrong. Wow, he actually asked for forgiveness that he didn't take anything from them. That's interesting because he didn't take, remember we saw that Paul said he didn't take anything from the Corinthians. He took it from other churches, but not the Corinthians. At least they go, Paul's here because he wants money. You know, So he said, I'm not going to take it. But here he's apologizing that I didn't take it because it would have been to your advantage if you would have given. But because you haven't given. But I'm sorry that I didn't help you understand that. Now, see, that was, his, that was his responsibility to illuminate the scriptures to them because they were doing something that they didn't understand, they didn't get, and he was trying to help them to understand that. And giving money is always an issue, right, with people. You know, how do I get someone to give 10%? Because if you push then all of a sudden they get this idea, you just want our money. And that's not the case. I want blessings for you from God. I don't want your money. The money doesn't go to me. I find that interesting that I've been accused of that. I've been accused of embezzlement. I've been accused of taking all the money just for myself. You know, all kinds of things. People don't know. I remember one person came in and said, I don't give because my uncle told me that you take all the money for yourself. I go, Where did, does your uncle go here? No. 
Well, how does he know? Well, he says all pastors do that. Oh, okay, I got you. So all pastors. Oh, that's still a great way of looking at life and, and figuring out things. I said, come on with me. And I pull out all the minutes, and I said, this is where all the money goes. And they're like, oh, okay, I didn't know that. And of course you didn't. You're listening to your uncle. <laughs> you know? And so they, their eyes were open. They understood, and that's my responsibility to give them that understanding. Of course, they never did give. So there was another issue there. They just didn't get it. Anyway, so Paul goes on, forgive me. Now for the third time, I am ready to come to you and I will be burdensome to you. In other words, I'll collect this time. For I do not seek you, yours, but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but for the parents for the children. And I will very gladly spent and be spent for your souls, though the more abundantly I love you and the less I am loved. And so what he's saying is this next time I come, I'm going to collect from you uh, because I want you to be blessed. It's not that I'm going to take from you. I just really want your heart. God wants your heart more than anything else. I am more than willing to be spent by you. You can use me if that's what you want to do or not use me. That's fine, but I love you. But be that as it may, I did not burden you. Nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you with guile. Now, guile means deceit. So I caught you guys as being deceitful. Did I take advantage of you by any of those whom I sent to you? I urged Titus to send our brother uh, with him. Does Titus take advantage? Did Titus take advantage of you? Did we not walk in the same spirit? Did we not walk in the same steps? Again, do you think that we excuse ourselves to you? We speak before God in Christ, but we. Do all things, beloved, for your edification. For I fear, lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I wish, and that I shall be found by you such as you do not wish. Lest there be contentions, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, backbiting, whispering, conceits, tumults, and least when I come again, may God my God will humble me among you and I shall mourn for many who have sinned before and have not repented of the uncleanliness, fornication, lasciviousness, which they have practiced. And that's the underlying word there. If you want to underline your Bible, this is what they have been practicing constantly. The Corinthians were practicing these things. It's hard to correlate that when Paul says, that yet their souls are saved. Because how can a Christian be practicing these things? You know, it's difficult. They shouldn't be practicing things. I think that in time, that like the prodigal son, they come back to the father <clears throat> and they repent and surrender their lives again. But if you continue to practice these things and you, and you die, then the Bible says you will not inherit the kingdom of God. There's a point where, where you, your spirit has been given up to these things, as Romans chapter 1 says. It's a fine line, and it takes a lot more studying to really understand it. So uh, we don't have that time, but it's interesting. I like what Chuck says, because anytime someone asks, Chuck, once saved or always saved, Chuck? Give us the answer, come on. And he'd go through this whole teaching, take 45 minutes, and it, 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 interesting how he'd do it. And I love the way he took it. went through this whole example, and they came all the way at the very end. Once saved or not saved, he says this. Abide in Christ, and Christ will abide in you. And you won't have to worry about whether you're saved or not. <laughs> right? Just abide in Christ, and Christ will abide in you, and your salvation is set. So you shouldn't be asking that question. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your precious word and for the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. It was through his blood that was shed upon that cross that gave us eternal life, Lord. And what we need to do, Lord, is surrender our lives to Jesus Christ. We need to receive that truth, into our hearts, and we need to surrender our lives to him and say, Lord, use us. Fill us with the Holy Spirit. Change us, Lord God, that we would no longer be the old people that we were, but we would become new in Jesus Christ, learning and growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful, have a wonderful um, weekend. We love you. We hope... Uh, your relationship with Jesus will continue to grow. Amen.